Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark cards bring you an unusual true story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And here is our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Tonight we pay tribute to a man whose name has been all but forgotten in the annals of American history, and yet, had it not been for a frontier missionary doctor named Marcus Whitman, the Oregon Territory might never have become a part of these United States. And so, we bring you another true story about real people on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Now, here's Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. When you want to send a card to someone who is dear to you, here's a simple rule to follow. Look for the hallmark and crown on the back of each greeting you choose. Through the years, this famous symbol has stood for quality at its best. Quality in craftsmanship, in design, in words that say what you want to say, just the way you want to say it. And you can be sure of it, hallmark cards will tell your friends instantly, you care enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, soon to release Dory Sherry's production, Take the High Ground, Starring Richard Widmark, Carl Malden, and Elaine Stewart. And now, Mr. Barrymore brings you tonight's exciting story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Marcus Whitman, Frontier Doctor. The year is 1836, the place, the juncture of the Walla Walla and the Columbia Rivers, deep in the heart of the northwestern wilderness. You there, Indian. Where's Whitman? He mean Hogan, make medicine. Will you just tell him to come out here? No tell while he make medicine. Look here, Indian. You know me. Everybody know you, Hudson Bay Company man. You, McDonald. That's right, I'm McDonald. And when I tell an Indian to do something, he does it. Now get in there and tell Whitman I want to see Quiet him. up there. Stop that infernal racket. Whitman? Oh, it's you, McDonald. I might have known. I have a bone to pick with you, Whitman. Let's move away from the Hogan, McDonald. There's a sick woman in there. Now well, then, what is it this time? I'll put it straight, man. You've gone too far. How so? We didn't mind you and those other missionaries coming into the territory from the States. That part of it was all right. We'd like to have a few settlers in these parts. And we didn't even mind your nonsense with teaching hymns to the Indians and tending to their ailments. I'm sure that's very Christian of you, McNaughton. But we do mind when you give them heathen savages corn and teach them how to grow it. That, my good doctor, is going too far, and you'll not be doing it anymore. I don't think I understand. No? Oh, I'll show you what I mean. Indian! What do you want? It's October, Indian. Fur time. How many furs you got to trade with the Hudson Bay Company? No got fur. No trap this year. No more trap. You hear that, Whitman? Why no more trap? Got all gone. Got cornfield, fish and river. No more live like gypsy. Gypsy? Where do you learn gypsy what? Whitman squaw teach me new word. Teach me read and write and pray to Lord our Savior. You hear that, Whitman? I hear. And now, if you'll pardon me, I'll get back to my horse. I've got two more sick calls to make before dark. I'm warning you, Whitman. We want you out of the territory, you and the rest of your friends. You're ruining the Indians, Whitman, you and your civilizing, and that's bad for business. Mr. McDonald. What? 
Business be blasted, Mr. McDonald. I wish you wouldn't worry about it, dear. The snows are starting now, and they can't possibly do anything about us until after the spring thaw. My dear Narcissa, I may be a missionary, but I am not a man who leaves things to providence. But, Marcus, what can you possibly do? One man against a tremendous company, in a wilderness, without laws or courts or redress of any if kind. If I don't do something, no one will. Wait until spring, dear. I'm sure things will work out. I don't think you understand the situation fully, Narcissa. By spring, Oregon may be incorporated into Canada. Should that happen, the company would have a free hand with us. Oh, you mean the border thing? Yes, the border thing. The United States and Canada have established their border from the Atlantic Ocean to the Rocky Mountains. Beyond that, they're still in the discussion stage. But surely the United States will claim Oregon. After all, the only settlers here are Americans. No, no, the way things stand, they won't. They know nothing of this land back in Washington. I don't think there's one man in the entire District of Columbia who has ever even seen the Oregon Territory. But surely they've heard of it. Yes. Yes, they've heard of it. Listen to what the learned statesman Daniel Webster has to say about Oregon. He says, Oregon is a vast, worthless area, a region of savages, wild beasts, deserts of shifting sands, cactus, and prairie dogs. Moreover, what can we ever hope to do with a coast of 3,000 miles? 3,000 miles, gentlemen, rock-bound, cheerless, and not one harbor on it. Gentlemen, I ask you, what use have we for such a country? What use have we for such a country? I really don't see how he can say that. There are no deserts in Oregon, and as for cactus... The point is that he is saying it. And they are believing him. And by spring, they'll have thrown this great, beautiful territory away. Thrown it to Canada for the exclusive benefit of the private traders. And so, gentlemen, there you have it. Uh, Dr. Whitman, your generous offer to make the necessary journey to Washington is, of course, welcomed by us all. But I should like to point out that you can't cross the Rockies until late spring. And by then, Congress will have passed their acts and stand adjourned. I plan to leave tomorrow morning. But, oh, but Dr. Whitman... Tomorrow morning, Dr. Fordyce. No man has ever crossed the country in winter. Why, in the mountains, the snow is drifted 20, 30 feet deep. The temperature is many degrees below zero, and there are savages, wolves, bears, rivers to cross, and blizzards. Dr. Marcus, my friend, do not make this journey. It, no matter how you may be devoted to the Oregon Territory and your work in it, you will be going down into the valley of death to attempt this thing. Marcus Whitman, doctor of medicine, man of God, an American. In later years, Horace Greeley wrote of him. Marcus Whitman, once seen, was a man not to be forgotten. He was of medium height, more compact than spare, had a stout shoulder and a large head covered with iron gray hair. He carried himself awkwardly. He seemed built as a man for whom more stock had been furnished than was used systematically and gracefully. He was not quick in motion or speech, and there was no trace of the fanatic in the man. But he was a profound enthusiast. This, then, was the man who set off in October to span the continent in the dead of winter, a feat never before accomplished. And Marcus Whitman was doing this not for gold or for fame, but for the love of the land and a way of life.
in just a moment, we return to the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. The other day, I picked up an old book from my library shelf and discovered this passage written on the flyleaf. He alone has lost the art to live who cannot win new friends. It seems it was written by a half-forgotten American author named Silas Mitchell almost a century ago. And yet the truth of these words is evident and timeless. For one of the great joys of day-by-day -day living, and of traveling, too, is the joy of meeting people we like and keeping in touch with them through the years. Now, even though most of us can't visit our friends as often as we want to, there's one wonderful way to let them know they are in our thoughts. I mean by sending Hallmark cards on holidays or birthdays or whenever you want to say, hello there, how are you today? At a fine store where Hallmark cards are sold, you'll find special greetings for every occasion and for every friend, old or new. It takes so little time to select and address an appropriate Hallmark card. And you can be sure each one you mail will be received with joy and remembered long after. Just look for the Hallmark and crown on the back of the cards you choose. It's the famous symbol that tells your friends you care enough to send the very best. And now Lionel Barrymore brings you the second act of our true story of Marcus Whitman. Marcus Whitman took with him one man, General Aza Lovejoy, a reliable friend and an experienced traveler. He also took his dog and two extra pack horses. They left the mission on the 5th of October, 1836, struck due east, moving as fast as was humanly possible. They were racing the weather, racing for time and for their very lives. Americans from Oregon. Fast friends, let's have a look at you. Now, just a minute here. You say you come 450 miles in only 11 days? what I'd call right per traveling. You know, I can't understand why you gentlemen don't wait till spring. Now, this is an urgent matter. If you could recommend a guide, we'd be much obliged. Hmm. Yeah, there's always somebody hanging around the fort who'll help you out for a price. We're willing to pay. I think I ought to warn you, General. Company of scouts come in yesterday from east of here. He said the snow's already 20 feet deep in some of the canyons and drifting a whole lot deeper. We must go through. Dr. Whitman had an idea which we discussed on our way here. He thought of a new route to the States going by way of Uinta and from there striking south between the ranges, leaving the Great Salt Lake to our right and heading for Santa Fe. No fact. Uh, you say, you say Santa Fe? That's right. Santa Fe, huh? Yeah, you might work it going that way. Never heard nobody doing it, though. Yes, but could it be done? How about it, Pedro? Well, I don't know. Could try. Will you guide us? Sure. But I want a lot of money. How much? Well, it's a long trip. I might not come back. It's dangerous. Yes, yes, we, we know that. But how much do you want? My, my feet, they, they hurt me when it snows. Lots of snow between here and Santa Fe. Please, Mr. Pedro, quanto, quanto? Thousands of miles. I want uh, $15. <laughs> From Fort Hill to Uinta, they met very severe weather. Incidentally, Uinta, as you may have guessed, is now the state of Utah. They passed the Great Salt Lake and turned south. General Lovejoy kept a journey of this part of the journey. On the trail toward Grand River, we encountered a terrible snowstorm which compelled us to seek shelter in a deep, 
dark canyon. Here were we entrapped for 10 days. On endeavoring to leave, we met with winds of such severity that the animals became blinded, maddened, and our guides stopped us. No. Uh, Ay, it's no use. What is it, Pedro? Where are we? I don't know. I never see this place before. Are we lost? I don't know, General. I think maybe we are. But we must keep on. We can't stay here all winter. Senor, you are a priest. Uh, in a manner of speaking, I'm a Protestant clergyman. Well, then I think maybe you better say a little prayer for us. I shall never forget the sight. Dr. Whitman knelt in the snow and prayed. It was bitter cold. Now, I am not a very religious man, and I don't hold much faith in miracles, but as Marcus Whitman prayed, a very strange thing happened. One of the pack animals turned and started away from its companions. Hey! Hey, come back here! Pedro, where is he going? Uh, Dr. Whitman. Dr. Whitman. What is it, Pedro? The mule. The mule. He knows a way out of here. What do we do? We follow him. Doctor, you... You make a pretty good prayer, huh? I think maybe you better teach me that prayer in case I ever get lost without you. Huh? Our forced camp had exhausted our supplies. Pushing ever southward through desolate canyons and deepening drifts, we subsisted on bitter roots and bark, pine needles. Game there was none, save the wolves who followed our trail. We slaughtered one of the pack animals and ate it. The following week, near crazed with hunger, the guide and I secretly killed Dr. Whitman's faithful dog. It was a deed for which I shall ever be ashamed. We ate him secretly. And if the doctor suspected what we did, he never said a word. He endured his privations with great fortitude. He was a man with but a single goal, which he expressed immediately upon our arrival in Santa Fe. Have they had any news from Washington? Uh, the clerk says they've heard nothing for 12 weeks. <laughs> From Santa Fe, they struck east toward Bent's Fork in what is now known as Colorado. A cheerless, dreary plains journey. Day after day, they were trailed by great packs of silent gray wolves. Four days' journey out of Bent's Fork, they met a mule train bound for El Paso. They say there is a company of 50 packers leaving day after tomorrow for St. Louis from the fort. Won't be another trip until spring. Day after tomorrow. No? Horses can't make it. Take four days. We can do it any faster. We've got to travel with that train. Listen, Pedro. General, my horse is still good. I'll go it alone and have them wait for you. Marcus, you can't do it. You don't know the country. And those wolves, senor, they like to get you alone. Never mind that. Just you tell me the way. <laughs> Four days later, the guide and myself rode into Fort Bent. The pack train had not yet departed. Dr. Whitman had seen nothing. The man had never arrived at his destination. I spoke to Colonel Bent, and he sent out his best scouts in the search. Myself, the guide, and one of the scouts followed the banks of the Arkansas River for 100 miles, knowing that if Whitman were alive, he would make for the river. Every night, our camp would be surrounded by hungry, gaunt, gray wolves, which, as they were shot down, would be torn to pieces and devoured by their fellows. It took 70 men to find Marcus Whitman. He was lost in the mountains, and when they brought him in, although he was very weak and in fever, he insisted on joining the Packers' train, and he traveled with him to St. Louis. And what about the treaty, sir? Has it been signed? You mean the treaty with Canada? Yes. Oh, been signed for months. Heck, Doctor, they signed that treaty just about the time you was leaving well, Oregon. It, it can't be. It is, though. 
Seems a pity you had to come all the way to St. Louis just to find that but, out. But tell me, did they extend the border all the way? Does it reach the Pacific? Nope. The part they signed about runs only as far west as the Rockies. They'll get around to straightening up the rest of it next week. Hear that, General? Saddle up, man. We're going on to Washington. <laughs> What you say interests me very much, Doctor, but uh, frankly, I don't see what I can do. Mr. Webster, there's one thing you can do for me. You can notify your fellow senators that you were mistaken in your pronouncements, your pronouncements on a territory which you have never seen. My dear fellow, you're a doctor and a missionary, and I have no doubt you perform your functions with gusto. But uh, politics are not your function, and moreover, I would advise you not to dabble. Dabble? Yes, dabble. It so happens that we have a strong ulterior purpose in the disposition of Oregon. And what is that? Off the record. Off the record. We intend trading it to England in exchange for the banks of Labrador. You're out of your senses. Labrador? What's that? Fish, fish and muskeg. Quite so. Well, I can see I'm wasting your time and my own, Mr. Webster. I bid you good day, sir. <laughs> America was still relatively small in population, and if a private citizen had the determination, he could take his problems to the White House. That's what Marcus Whitman did. <laughs> it was a curious meeting. The President of the United States and the Reverend Dr. Marcus Whitman of the Oregon Territory. Dr. Whitman, how do you do, sir? I've heard of you from Secretary Webster. I have no doubt of that, Mr. President. And in view of his report, I'm rather surprised that you're granting me this audience. Not at all, not at all. You know, the President's in a funny spot. He has to keep in touch with the people, even those who are out of the country and not in a position to vote for him. Well, incorporate us in the United States, and I'll personally promise you the vote of every missionary in Oregon. All 14 of us. <laughs> yes, sir, the President's in a funny spot. I uh, like Daniel Webster, like to listen to him talk, but that speech he made about Oregon, you know where he got his information? No, sir. Got it from a man whose brother is owner of a large fur trading company. I know, because the man told me the same thing. Lately, I've heard different, though. I hear Oregon is something more than a desert. Desert? Well, there's no desert in the whole territory. There's no sand, excepting that which sparkles on the Pacific Ocean. Oregon is fertile, sir. Fertile and just begging for pioneer Americans to come and turn her soil. That may well be, sir. But what with the mispronouncements on the Oregon Territory, public sentiment is pretty much against the place. I can't help you personally, but I can send you to a man who can. Well, I'd appreciate it, Mr. President. Yes, sir. I think you'd better go up to New York and see the editor of the New York Tribune. He'll help you. Name's Horace Greeley. Thank you, Mr. President. Dr. Whitman, this nation can never repay you for your brave effort to save the Oregon Territory for the United States. I like you, and I believe you. I personally am going to take your story to the people of this country. Thank you, Mr. Greeley. Labrador, eh? <laughs> Boy! Boy! Tell him to stop the press. I have a new front page. America is being bartered for herring. The rest is history. Horace Greeley was a fighter. The New York Tribune took public opinion, formed it into a club and dealt the skeptics a blow which they never forgot. And when the United States and Canada established their border for all time, the Oregon Territory became a part of America. And those magnificent, wondrously beautiful states, they were with us today. Thanks to the will and courage and determination of the man of medicine, the man of God, 
and the man of the American people, Marcus Whitman. I'll be back in a minute to tell you about the really remarkable woman we're honoring next week on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. She was a woman of amazing courage who defied all opposition and marched right into American history. But first, uh, Frank Goss wants to tell you about a smart little lady of six years. This morning I had a phone call from my little niece who celebrated her sixth birthday yesterday. And I asked her to tell me all about her birthday party, and she said... Well, the games were nice and the cake was nice, but the presents were best of all. You know, Uncle Frank, some of them were as pretty on the outside as they were on the inside. Well, I couldn't help thinking just how important gift wrappings really are to little folks and to grown-ups, too. Obviously, the papers and ribbons you use on a gift box are the first things to greet the eye, and they can show your care and thoughtfulness as surely as the gift you choose. That's why I think you'll enjoy selecting all your gift wrap items at a fine store where Hallmark cards are sold. You'll find that Hallmark gift wraps are beautifully designed and crafted in colors as fresh as a rainbow. There are small prints for tiny boxes, big dramatic prints for the largest gifts of all, and styles for many different occasions. So next time you want to make a special gift, a thing of beauty to receive, look for the wrappings with the Hallmark and crown on the label. It's the symbol you like on your greeting cards. When you care enough to send the very best. And now here again is Lionel Barrymore. Frank, you, you are certainly right about the excitement on the youngster's face when he reaches out for a gift all wrapped up in pretty paper. And as the youngster grows up, you'll find that these added signs of thoughtfulness help make our daily lives a whole lot pleasanter and happier. Yet knowing how to give graciously is more important than the contents or the price of the gift. Well, Frank, I, I thought that today's story was an adventurous and colorful tale, didn't you? Indeed, yes. Yes, you, you made doubly exciting because it actually happened. Now, next week we have another true story of outstanding personal bravery. This time we're honoring a woman. Mary Ann Bickerdyke. I guarantee you will remember her story for a good long time. Yes, next week the Hallmark Hall of Fame honors Mary Ann Bickerdyke, a woman of the ladies' aid in Galesburg, Illinois, who set off with a trainload of supplies for our Civil War troops. She took one look at the suffering of the soldiers and remained as the first woman in the front lines, amazing generals with her unflinching courage, energy, and boundless compassion. Yes. I uh, hope you'll all be with us next week on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. Remember, you're also invited to the Hallmark Hall of Fame on television on Sundays, starring Miss Sarah Churchill. Until next week, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. <laughs> For Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, a Hallmark card when you carry enough to send the very best. Our producer director is William Gay. Our script tonight was written by Wilbur James. Marcus Whitman was played by John Stevenson. Featured in our cast tonight were Charlotte Lawrence, Alastair Duncan, Lawrence Dobkin, Ted DeCorsia, Harry Bartell, John Daner, Tony Barrett, Harley Bear, and Herb Butterfield. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all until next week at the same time when we present another true story of an inspiring moment in the life of a famous person. Next week, we honor Mary Ann Bickerdyke on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is the CBS Radio Network. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.